chapter 47. We're going to actually read verses 1 through 12, but you know how I do, man. I, uh, I sometimes I got to do a Sunday school lesson in the midst of my, in the midst of my sermon. I don't apologize for it. I know what the Lord's called me to do. You know, it's a good thing whenever you know what the Lord's called you to do. The Lord has not called me to be secret sensitive and to build a church with a whole bunch of people. The Lord has called me to disciple people. The Lord has called me to instruct people in the word of God and in the ways of God. Therefore, I can still show up over here. I'm just being real with you. Whether there be two people or 200 people, it's not going to make a difference to me because I know what God has called me to do. And I, you know what? By the grace of God, I'm going to keep doing it. You know, one time, one of my prayers, I was going through some stuff and I prayed this prayer. I said, Lord, weld my hands to the plow. Because, you know, sometimes whenever you go through life, especially whenever the Lord has called you to do the work of the ministry through the preaching of the word, teaching of the word, sometimes you can get frustrated. Do you ever get frustrated in life? I was just wondering. I don't even know why I'm going off on this, but I just wanted to just wanted to tell you this. Do you ever get frustrated? Of course you do, because you're you're living in a real world and there's real problems out there. And, you know, you think that preachers don't get frustrated. You know, listen, I don't want no fake preacher. I don't know about you. I don't know what kind of preacher you're looking for, but I don't want no fake preacher who's going to get up here and give me some kind of motive. I don't even need a motivational speaker. I'm going to be honest with you. I get up every morning by the grace of God, and I'm going to be motivated to take on the day, whether I'm working with my friend uh, Peak Roofing, whether I'm in Bayou Pediatrics as a nurse practitioner, whether I'm working out outside, whether I'm preparing for a message, whether I'm preaching a message. By the grace of God, he made me a motivated person, and I thank God for that. I'm going to get up by and and if, if the Holy Ghost will keep giving me life, I'm going to be motivated. Praise God. I don't need a motivational speaker. I need somebody to be real with me. Amen. And listen to me. Sometimes it can be frustrating. And, and, and you know what? Especially whenever we buy into the lie. I mean, you know why I think I'm talking about this? And it's okay for the people on the video to know. Because we don't, I don't know. It seems more empty in here than what it normally does. I don't know if it's because there's an echo or there's less people or, or what it is. But it just seems more empty. But I'm just trying to tell. And sometimes as a preacher, many times people get caught up in numbers and they can become frustrated. I'm not going off today. I promise you I'm going to get to my message. But, you know, you flip through the channels and you watch various sermons and you and you got people with mindsets out there and you can try all day long to try to convince them of something. And the reality of it is, is that they can't see it. Amen. So I'm hoping that you can see some things with me this morning. And I'm hoping that when I say some things that it makes some spiritual sense. Do you realize that that the church is not like an American corporation? And then the pastor is not supposed to be a CEO of an American corporation. Listen to me. If you part of an American business and free enterprise, I'm all about free enterprise and capitalism. But if you're part of an American business that has to do with people, theoretically, you'd want to walk through the doors and you'd want to see a whole lot of people. But can I tell you that just because you flip it through the channels on the TV and you see golden chandeliers hanging from the ceiling and a sanctuary full of people, that does not automatically mean that what's coming from behind the pulpit is the truth about Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. As a matter of fact, there's a good chance right. if you walk me down, it doesn't mean that it's the case. I'm not trying to say that all big churches aren't telling the truth. Don't put words in the preacher's mouth. But what I am saying is there's a good chance if you walk through the doors and you see a sanctuary packed out, that there's a possibility that they're not speaking the truth. Because let me tell you what I've learned about the word of God. When the word of God goes forth in my own life, many times it pricks my heart when there's areas of my life that aren't lining up according to God and according to his ways. Whenever that pricking takes place, that conviction of the Holy Spirit, guess what? It's called, it, it results in an uncomfortable feeling. People don't like to feel uncomfortable. People would rather to feel comfortable. I got this new saying that I say, and, and you know, and, and listen to me, I've calmed it down quite a bit. I don't say it the way my daddy would have said it, okay? Because my dad did not have a Christian mouth. But what I'm saying, but what, this is my new saying. You know what? I'm not purposefully trying to chap nobody's backside. And sometimes I have to feel like I got to powder their backside. And sometimes I'll powder, but sometimes I'll probably chap 
Why did I say that? I don't really know other than to say sometimes the word of God comes forth in a way and I don't like the way that it makes me feel. It can be, it can start to irritate something that's on the inside of me, kind of like a diaper rash would do for a child. It'll irritate us. You got a chap butt. It doesn't feel good, right? And, and you know what? And so sometimes people can't handle the word of God when it goes forth in such a way that it causes that irritation on the inside of them. And they feel like, man, this is uncomfortable. My, my backside doesn't feel comfortable in this. So I want to get up. I want to find a new place. I want somebody that's going to put powder on my rash. But the reality of it is, is this, God is not here just to make us feel better about ourselves and to leave us in the place where we are. No, God's word wants to go forth and it wants to bring life. I'm talking about true life. I'm not talking about some fake life. I'm not talking about some facade where some preachers up here just giving us a whole bunch of motivating words. We're living in a real world and we're not warring against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against world rulers, against spiritual darkness and, wicked, and wickedness in the air. We are dealing with fallen angels and demon spirits and they want to destroy you. They want to eat your lunch. They want to kill your children. Listen to me, church. I can assure you they want to destroy everything about you. They want to kill your children. And these little let, let, let me tell you something. These churches that are over here like, oh yeah, I'm going to hire a youth pastor. He's a kid magnet. Let me tell you, sometimes some of these kid magnets that these bigger churches are hiring and don't tell me because I know I was in leadership and, and, and it's lust being brewed in the midst of all of that. I'm not saying lust can't still jump on these kids. Of course it can. But it's, it's all about building something that's not even reality. And, and people are growing up in these environments and they're not hearing the word of truth. They're not hearing the word of God. And therefore their life continues on down the path that they've always done. And they're trying to put a little bit of a mixture they make them a little gumbo. They take some good stuff and some bad stuff and they mix it together and they think, oh yeah, no, this tastes okay. A little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. Okay, yeah, no, I can live with this. Just don't bring me over there to that one where my, my booty gets chapped. I don't like getting my, my, my backside chapped. I want powder. I want to feel comfortable about where I am. That's what we're really dealing with here. Well, that's what we're really dealing with in the modern church when we call it seeker Sensitive. We don't want to offend the seekers. We don't want to offend those people that, that, that you know, they want to be comfortable. And let me tell you something. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to preach the truth. And a lie, you, you can find you a preacher that's got a different personality than me. And, and, and that, that, that's okay as long as he's telling you the truth. Amen? You just want to make sure your preacher's telling you the truth. Why would you want to go to church anyway? I mean, isn't there a whole lot of things you could be doing? You, you know, I mean, because if you're not getting the truth and it's not changing you on the inside, you really still have desires to live in the world anyway. Come on. Can we be real with one another? How many of you have lived as a Christian and your mind and your heart was still overwhelmed with desires to go back to your way of living? I'm telling you right now, don't tell me that it's not because now you're a liar and you walked into the house of God. The reality of it is, is that God's people have always dealt with that. Why do you think the, the children of Israel, when they left Egypt, wandered around in a wilderness longing for the melons and the onions and the leeks of Egypt. They looked backwards at their old life. They forgot they were slaves. Just like a person that used to get drunk on the weekend, forgot that his head used to be in the toilet when he was puking at night, forgot the hangover that he had the next morning, forgot all the other intricate details that we can't even get into, and all he remembers was the good times and the, oh yeah, the little party and how everybody was laughing and how, oh yeah, we were kicking it with our with our boys and our girls and we was having so much fun. No, no, it's a lie. It's a lie. And you can't mix the two together because the word of God says, what fellowship does light have with darkness? And God's people have always been called to be separated out from the world. What do you think circumcision was all about? What do you think the giving of the law was all about? God wants his people to be different, to be separated. Hallelujah. Guess what? He's never asked you to do it in your own strength. He'll never ask you to do it in your own strength. No, he has provided a way to change you on the inside. He has provided a way that you can access grace for daily living to strengthen you, 
to empower you to walk with God, to start looking more like God, to start thinking more like God, to start going to places where God would go. And when you go there to start doing things and saying things that God would say, hallelujah, because why? You are a representative of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. All right, let me preach my message. Y'all ready? Before I preach, this is my little Sunday school thing I was going to tell you about. I'm drawing you a map. Y'all know this is my famous little map right here. And what this map is, this, this is the Mediterranean Sea, and this is the Jordan River. This is the Sea of Galilee. Listen, Jerusalem is somewhere about right here, but instead of drawing a circle, I'm just going to draw a square because then we're going to pretend that's the temple. All right? In the story that we're about to read, it seems like to me, this because this would be the east, this would be the west, this would be the south, this would be the north. And it seems like to me, and as we read it, that there's water flowing out of this temple. It's definitely coming from the east, and, and, it's, and now it's coming down into this area here, into this thing called the Dead Sea. I wanted you to see that. Now, this is not the majority of my message. I just wanted you to get a visual, because we're going to talk about the temple of God. We're going to talk about a river of life. That streams forth. And, and, and the Lord has a word for you this morning about God's life and how he wants to impart that life on the inside of you and on the inside of me. Amen. All right, let's read Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 through 12. It says, after, now listen, real quick too, let me, let me just say this. Ezekiel, the time frame of Ezekiel is somewhere around 600 BC, somewhere around there. All right. This is an Old Testament passage of scripture. This is after the children of Israel have exited Egypt, after they've entered into the promised land, after the time frame of the judges, after the time frame of the great King David. And now there's been a string of kings that have gone in disobedience towards God. When people, when the people of God live in disobedience towards God, what happens? It results in bondage. It results in slavery. The children of God have, have found themselves in, in slavery again to Babylon, to Assyria, because they went against the Lord and the Lord allowed their enemies to, in, to captivate them. Did you not know that whenever you open up the doors as a child of God today, you let the enemy of your soul come in and bring you back under captivity, even though Jesus died to set you free, even though Jesus died on the cross to give you victory. When you and I begin to open up doors, listen, the children of Israel under the leadership of these wicked kings saw what the world looked like, saw what the world had, and they said, I still want some of that. It just went on and on and on through throughout the history of the children of Israel and it continues on in the lives of Christians even this morning that's why this message is relevant because it's relevant to people's lives because people still live in this place many times what we would what people want to hear no I want to mess I want you to preach a message that tells me how I can keep my life bill still or I can I can listen in a roundabout way it will because listen, whenever the word of God enters into your heart, he'll start teaching you all kind of stuff. He'll start teaching you to quit going to places that steals money out your pocket. Right. He'll start teaching you to, to learn how to handle your money like a good steward that you would live with inside of your means so that you can pay your bill. Hallelujah. He'll give you a promotion. He'll give you increase. He'll put more money in your pocket and he'll sew it up so that the money doesn't fall out of it. And that's where the true word of God will begin to work on the inside of your life. So that's where we are in Ezekiel, about B.C. 600. The children of Israel have found themselves captive again in various ways to their enemies. And they're, they're, they're down. You know, even as a Christian, hallelujah, whenever we open up those doors and we allow the enemy of our soul to come in, it can become very dark. Have you ever done that before? Yeah. Have you ever been a Christian and gone the wrong way and allowed the enemy to come back in? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the darkness that is connected to that. Because, you know, listen, I, that's why I, I prayed, I started off by talking about the fact that you're not in a war against flesh and blood. Oh, Whether it's the people that are talking negatively to you constantly and telling you you're worthless or... 
people that you work with that laugh at you to your face or behind your back because you take a stand for Jesus mm -hmm. or whatever it is. I have been through some of the, I've been around some of the rough, look dude, I used to be a snubbing hand. And let me tell you something, my supervisor, I'm, well, I'm just going to tell you, I just talk real with you. He looked at me one time and he said, and I, look, my dad was mean, bro. This dude, no, I don't want none of this guy. He said, let me tell you something, son. I shoot crank and kick people's butt for fun. You better put, you better put your, get your whatever he was trying to tell me to do. And he'd laugh at me and he'd make fun of me in front of all these other people because of my stand for Jesus. And they'd separate themselves from me. And that was before God really got a hold of me. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that there's a whole world out there of mean people like that, that are living knee deep in the world. And just your presence alone right. will be a source of irritation if you're taking a stand for Jesus. It will be a source of irritation in their life. It will bring conviction to them. Because listen, Jesus said this, if the world hates you, remember this, it hated me first. That's why I got a problem. I need to just stay focused, but that's why I got a problem whenever we got churches that are so buddy-buddy with the community. I'm not trying to say we shouldn't help the community, but when the community loves you that much, and all, and all your focus, and I'm talking, when I say the community, I'm not talking about people, no, I'm not talking about souls, I'm talking about being interconnected with government and having a key to the city and hosting the Easter egg hunt for the Easter whatever the case. And Lord, we're not even going to get into all that. That's what I'm talking about. Being so interconnected with the community that the community loves us. When in reality, the community many times is of the world system. All right. The, the people of God, BC 600. Like I said, going through all of these things and whenever we're in this place of frustration, God always brings a word of encouragement. Amen. <laughs> Don't you know that there's always hope? No matter what you're going through, there's always hope. Listen, even after. But, but Matt, I've heard that you've had I've heard that you've had tragic things happen in your life that seemed like there could have been no hope. I'm here to tell you this morning. I'm still preaching that message to myself right now as we speak. And no matter how bad it looks or how dark it gets, you don't know what's happened on the other side. And I'm here to tell you that there is always hope. Don't let people lie to you. And t it ain't nobody got a God figured out. We know as much about God as what he will allow us to know. But I'm here to tell you that his mercy endures forever and that, that his grace is flowing and that it's changing and that it's getting hope. And even in the darkest of times that I have experienced, God's voice would show up and bring a word of hope. Hallelujah. And that's where the children of Israel are. They are in the midst of darkness. The choices that they have made in their lives have resulted in captivity, have resulted in their enslavement. But God would bring a word of hope to them to encourage them and let them know that guess what? God's not done with Israel. God's not done with Israel. God's not done with this world. God has a big plan. And no matter how it looks out there in the midst of COVID and what conspiracy theorists say, and probably half of it's true and whatever's going on, no matter all that stuff, God is still in control. And if conspiracy theorists are right and Illuminati stuff is real and all this stuff is taking place, guess what? God is still on the throne. God sent Jesus to die on the cross. And hallelujah, he is going, God is the one that's allowing things to happen. Yes. That's what the church doesn't want to hear. Oh no, they're still trying to live a secret sensitive life in the midst of a world that's falling apart. And it ain't going to work, brothers and sisters, because we got to speak the truth. That God is going to allow. Did you not read the book? Did you not read the end of the story? God is going to allow the Antichrist to have power upon the earth. Amen. Right. He is going to allow the Antichrist to begin to spread. It, listen, this system's already been in existence. Sure. This is the system of Babylon that's just coming to fruition. This has been going on in a corporate manner since the Tower of Babel. This is all going to come to an end, Revelation 17 and 18, with the harlot of Babylon. It's a financial system that's already been in existence. A one world government that they've been trying to move towards and trying to get rid of boundaries, boundaries and borders. To think, to, to think that we still, Lord help us. 
We're going to sit here and tell you that, that people want to take away your sovereignty and want to take away your borders and you're still going to vote for it? Whenever we're done, I don't, listen to me, I don't care if people get mad at me. When we're going to sit here and vote for people that kill babies? What in the world are we coming to? And we're going to call ourselves Christians? No, that's a problem, church. That, that does not coincide with the ways of God and the character of God. God's about freedom and liberty. God's about life, not death. And that's a big part of my message this morning. God's bringing a message of hope to the children of Israel in the midst of all of this suppression and frustration. And he's letting them know there's coming a day. And, he, and he's giving them a visual of, of the temple and a river flowing out of that temple. And this river brings life. Let's read it. Afterward, he brought me again. This is a vision that the angel of the Lord is given to Ezekiel the prophet. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. That's talking about the temple. All right? The door of the temple. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house. You know what a threshold is, right? It's the, it's the, it's the piece at the bottom of a door. So I, from the threshold of the temple eastward, for the forefront of the temple stood toward the east. And waters came down from under the right side of the temple at the south side of the altar. I want you to see that. Doors and an altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without uh, unto the other gate by the way that looks eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. And he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me through. The waters were to the loins or the waist. Afterward, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen. Waters to swim in. A river that could not be passed over. Verse 6, and he said unto me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink or the origin of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, these water, waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea. Which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. I drew that picture just so you could see. What sea are we talking about? Dead the Dead Sea. These waters issue out toward the east country, go down into the desert and the sea. And it shall come to pass, verse 9, that everything that lives, which moves, wheresoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish. Because these waters shall come there, for they shall be healed. And everything shall live where the river comes. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi even unto Ineglium. They shall be a place, they shall be a place to spread forth their nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceedingly many. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. And by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat. That's old King James. I've taught you that before. For food. Whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters... They issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Big thing nowadays, everybody got a bump, a lot of people have a bumper sticker, salt life. That's not what I'm preaching this morning. I'm preaching fresh life. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, again, we thank you for the opportunity to preach your gospel. Lord, I feel like you've given me this message about fresh life, Lord, about a river that flows from, from God, and it brings healing. It brings new life. 
it changes the environment. It changes the atmosphere. I pray, Lord, that you would use me as a vessel and a mouthpiece and to speak forth your word, oh Lord God, and whoever would be able to hear it, that would have an effect in their life. That their life, our life, my life would never be the same. Because your word, Lord God, many times we can't see it right away, but your word is like a seed. And it, and it, it cracks open. And it germinates. And it begins to grow. Lord, I pray that the seed of your word would grow on the inside of our hearts and that it would produce change in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Fresh life. Hallelujah. This prophecy from Ezekiel, it describes a river of life. You know, Psalms have been written about this, this story. I mean, we actually sing it in here. Uh, I think we sang it recently. The river of life sets my feet a dancing. The river of life fills my heart with cheer. Uh, churches have been named. There's a church. There was a church in our community called River Life. This is this is what it talks about. It's talking about the new river. The river brings life to whatever it touches. You know this this scene describes a day in the future where this literal river will flow and bring life. But I have to tell you that the river is flowing today. Amen. I want you to know that the river of life is flowing today. It brings life to whatever it touches. The power of the Holy Spirit is like, don't be scared of the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Spirit is like a flowing river that, if allowed, will flow and grow and bring life into the dead places of people's hearts. The, this river is the life of the Holy Spirit that flows because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? That is the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. Uh, what does that gospel mean, preacher? The gospel of Jesus Christ is what allows the river of the Holy Spirit to flow and turn dead things into living things. In verse 1, it mentioned the water source and it described that it was two specific places or parts of the temple. Number one was the door. Number two was the altar. These two aspects of temple of the temple directly correlate to the person and the ministry of Jesus. Just bear with me as I give you scripture. The door. I want to talk to you about the door real quick. Can you go to John chapter 10 verses 9 through 10? In this scripture, Jesus said, I am the door. He said, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Saved from what, preacher? Saved from the lies of the world. Saved from the curse of sin. Saved from the condemnation and guilt of sin. Saved from the lies of the enemy that would bring destruction into your life. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and he shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You know, doors describe access. I used to always go step outside the door and I would talk about the difference in the two different places as a, use it as an illustration, right? On the outside, describing that as though it were the world that we live in and it, that is harsh. And, that, and that, that the enemy is out there and he's trying to destroy us. And yet there was a door that, that we could open up because Jesus was the door. And through faith, believing in our heart and confessing with our mouth and inviting Jesus into our heart and repenting of our sin and asking God to have his way, it opens up a door and it brings us from one place to the next place. I've talked to you about before, like it's almost like moving into a new neighborhood. Amen. Well, you don't have a bunch of, you have freedom and liberty to live for God in the new neighborhood. There's grace flowing in the new neighborhood. The power of the Holy Spirit is moving in your life. He's strengthening you in the new neighborhood. You, you know, you're not operating in your own strength anymore, but you're operating in the strength of God. He's giving you hope because that's what the word of God says. That's a door. It's an access way. But just as you can go in one way, you can also go out the other. And, you know, the scripture talks about in the New Testament about opening up doors and letting the devil put a foothold. I've done that, too, before where you open up a door and you think you're just going to take a little peek and you're going to look in on the inside and you're going to hurry up and close it. No, it don't work that way, my friend. 
When you open up a door, you give permission to the enemy to come into your life. And whenever that happens many times, you can't close it as quickly as what you'd like to. Because many times we're not at rock bottom like we think we are. We haven't allowed it. God, God is all about convincing you that his word is true. He's all about convincing me that his word is true. And sometimes we act like we're convinced, but deep, deep, deep down on the inside, places that only the Holy Spirit can see. He knows that you're not really convinced yet. Oh, no, with your mouth, with my mouth, sometimes we try to convince God, Lord, I'm done. Lord, I'm done. And he's saying, no, you're not. You're not done. And I know you're not done. But whenever the time is right and whenever your heart is really lining up according to my ways and my will, and I know you're done, then I will move in. So don't give up, Christian, wherever you are. No matter how dark it is, hold on to Jesus. Hallelujah. And keep saying, Lord, I might not be done, but I want to be done. I want to be done and I want to be obedient to you. And I want to start moving into the right realm of where you are, oh Lord God. I want you to restore my prayer life. I want you to restore my thought life. I want you to restore my understanding of the word, Lord. I want you to restore me, restore my relationship. He's the door. The thief comes to steal from you. To steal, to kill, to destroy. This scene describes entrance into a pasture, right? That is associated with salvation. It's described as a door that one can go in and out. Not like when you were a child. You, you, you remember that? I remember my brother. You, you can't just keep going in and out the door. Make up your mind, boy. You're either going to stay in the house or you're going to go outside. No, Jesus isn't all about them kind of rules. No, true freedom and liberty will allow you not to walk in and out of the world. That's not what Amen. I'm talking about. Amen. No, freedom and liberty to go. You know what a pastor describes in the, in the Bible? He, the psalmist David would talk about it all the time. He put me in a wide and an open space. It's talking about somewhere where I'm not confined. I'm not hemmed up. I'm not, I am not. don't have my back up against the wall and the enemy around me is about to destroy me. I'm out in a free place, an open place where the grace of God and the power of God is protecting me. That's the kind of door that Jesus has provided for us. He said, I am the door. Amen. And... Because this door provides access to the presence of God. Because you see, it was the door of the temple. When we read it in the Ezekiel passage, it was the door of the temple. Now listen, I can't just spit out a whole bunch of stuff without trying to slow down a little bit and teach. Whenever you and I in this church talk about the temple, we should automatically think about the presence of God. Why, preacher? I'm going to tell you why. Because the Bible teaches us that. Yeah, it's not in my notes, but we talk about it a lot. Put up Exodus 25a. You should be memorized this scripture by now just from how many times I put it up here. The sanctuary or the tabernacle or the tent in the Old Testament before the temple was built, God said, let them make me a, you could say tent, that I might dwell among them. God's plan for Israel was that the tabernacle, the tent, or the temple later on would house his presence. It's a very common theme throughout the scriptures that God's presence dwelled in a specific place so that he could be with his people. Even more so whenever you see the children of Israel carrying the ark with them to go before them in battle. That's really the presence because if you follow this Exodus passage through, what you'd find out is the exact place that God met with his people inside this tent was in the Holy of Holies on top of the mercy seat that covered the ark of the covenant. God's presence lived on the innermost part of that sanctuary, of that temple. Now, this is so beautiful, and this doesn't have anything to do with my message, but it's so, it's so awesome that I can't even pass it up. That God, when he, Jesus, I preached on her recently, the Samaritan woman, when, whenever, God, whenever Jesus told her there's a time coming... When those that are going to worship God are going to have to worship him according to spirit and in truth because God is a spirit. Did you know that you're a spirit? 
You're, you're, in, you're encased inside a physical body, but you are a spirit. You are an eternal being, and God is a spirit. And spirit cries out to spirit. And there's a connection that takes place to the new, to the, to the child of God, to the believer. When he's born again from the dead, when his spirit was dead to the things of God, and he gets born again. And now you can make that connection with the Holy Spirit. But what I'm saying is, is that just as deeply as the presence of God was on the inside of that tabernacle, when you get saved, that's where the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. comes to live because you're, you're like a sanctuary. You ever thought of that? I know I say it a lot, but you're like that Old Testament tent that was walking around on a journey that they would set it up in the presence of God was on the inside of that. And you and I now are like a bunch of Old Testament tents with the presence of God on the inside of us. Journeying. It's not probably a word, but I, maybe it is. I don't know. But I like the way it sounds. Journeying on this earth. <laughs> traveling on this earth with the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. We're like a bunch of Ark of the Covenants with the law, we're about to get into it here. I don't think I've ever said that before. And I don't know how long I've been preaching. We're like a bunch of Ark of the Covenants. Mm -hmm. with the Holy Spirit on top of us with the Word of God on the inside of us. Good. Come on, carrying the Word of God and the Spirit of God around with us on this God-forsaken earth that we're living in. That we're living on. God has a purpose for your life, Christian. Amen. And it's to be a witness for Jesus. But you're going to have to go through the door. Yes. You're going to have to go through the door to access Jesus. And when you access Jesus, now you get to enter in to the presence of God. Hallelujah. The, the description of the door of the temple takes it to another level. Again, it gives access to the presence of God. And from under the same doors where the rivers flowed. Jesus clearly explains in the passage that he is the door that leads to life. He is the healing from the death that Satan brings. The second thing was the altar. The altar is a type of the cross. Did you not know that? That the altar was an instrument of death, that the sacrificial system painted a picture that would one day result in the fulfillment of the cross that the animal sacrifices were types of Jesus because he was the fulfillment of the sin offering of the whole burnt offering of all of that to remove the sin debt that was on mankind and just as the altar is where the animal died the cross is where our savior died so the altar is a type of the cross the river didn't just flow under the door but the river flowed from the altar I'm here to tell you that the river of the Holy Ghost will flow into your life. The river of the Holy Spirit will bring healing into your life, but the only the, the source of the river comes from the man named Jesus and it comes from the cross that he died upon because it removed the sin debt and it allows you and I to have access to the presence of God so that the Holy Spirit can bring Amen. healing into our lives. I'm going to prove it to you in the scripture because that's what I do. By the grace of God, Jeremiah chapter 31 Verses 31 through 33. This, this passage of scripture is the Old Testament. About A.D. 600 to 700. So I'm telling you, like six to 700 years before Jesus. These are roundabout numbers. And this is what, this is what Je prophet, God told prophet Jeremiah. Behold, the days come, says the Lord. So he's talking about a future day. Mm -hmm. Behold, the days come that I will make a new covenant. And he goes on to say, not the covenant that I made with your fathers. He's talking about the new covenant. He's talking about Jesus. And look at this. With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, now go down to verse 33. This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law on their inward parts. See, just listen. Just as the law was on the inside of that, tap, that ark. You remember that? They put the tablets of the law on the inside of that ark, just where the presence of God was. Just as the law was on the inside of that ark, the word of God is saying that there's coming a day when he was going to put that law on the inside of people's hearts. Yeah. How does he do such a thing? 
Well, the same God that wrote with his finger and created the tablets of the law and gave Moses the overall law of God is the same God whose spirit comes to live on the inside of us. And now as we learn the word of God, the word of God is on the inside of our hearts, it's on the inside of who we are. And whenever we're walking upon this earth, we're not just carrying it in the ark like the, like the priests of old did while they were wandering or journeying upon the earth, but instead we're carrying the the very word of God on the inside of us. I will put it in their inward heart, heart parts. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. New covenant. I'm talking to you about the what the cross did for us. That song, I didn't tell them to sing that song. I don't even remember the exact lyrics, but it had something about the, how the cross made everything new. The cross changed everything. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36, 25 through 27. Same prophet that we read from, again talking about a future covenant. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And I know I've preached this before, but I'm not. Listen, some of y'all probably think, man, this preacher got a chip on his shoulder. Every time he turns around, he's trying to do it. That's because y'all don't know how people act. Y'all don't know how the people out there have treated, whenever I've tried, when the Lord gave me revelation after being a Christian and living in bondage for 12 years, a mediocre Christian life, and finding myself in that place, how do you think I'm going to preach about a child of God or the people of God opening up doors to sin, finding themselves in darkness and in captivity just like the children of Israel did under the time frame of the kings if I myself didn't live it and God didn't bring me out of it to experience that there's freedom outside side of that and that the way that freedom came was through Jesus. I wish it was just that easy just to say that one little two sentences, three sentences and say, drop my closed book and walk out the door. But it ain't that easy, my friend. <laughs> because that's not what the church wants to hear. And if you know how many times, if you knew how many times other preachers, other Christians that have been in the faith trying to fight against me on the truth of the doctrine that I'm, and listen, they don't want to see the scripture because I'm going to give you more scripture than you can probably tolerate. And it's writing. That's why I do that because that's what God's put in me. Let my word preach, son, and keep your grubby fingers out of my word. It's my word, and they're my people. And you will speak to my people my word. I don't need some little hireling to stand behind this pulpit and say the things that he wants to say so that he can put powdered booties up in the seat so that they'll put money in the tray. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a man or a woman that will allow me to use them as a mouthpiece to speak forth my truth to my people. Oh, that's the word of God right there, buddy. That is the word of God. That's the heart of God. Hallelujah. So here we go. All that was a rabbit trail to make this point. <laughs> I will sprinkle clean water on you. Oh, you see there, it's not just the blood that cleanses, but baptism. Oh, man, come on. And it bothered me for a while. Probably five years until the Lord showed me because I was digging and I was searching. And I know I've already taught y'all, but I'm going to teach you again. That the Bible says in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews that, that Moses cleansed the articles of the temple with the, with the water. But it talks about the blood. And you know why? Because it's talking about the ashes of the red heifer. Because the way the red heifer was killed was different than all other animals. You didn't cut its throat. You didn't bleed it out. Instead, you hit it over the head and you killed it like that. And you left all the blood contained on the inside. And then you burned the whole carcass till it was burnt down to a heap of ashes and then the ashes themselves had a tincture of the blood on the inside and then you make you get your solution and you take a pinch of the ashes and you stir it in there and then you sprinkle it that's what we're talking about the cleansing waters of the blood that of a type of what would be Jesus Christ hallelujah I will sprinkle you with clean water 600 years before Jesus would ever walk on the earth and I'm going to sprinkle you with waters that have the blood on the inside and I'm going to cleanse you from your filthiness and I'm going to cleanse you from your idols. Come on Christian. Why well, you got no idols? Oh yeah, you had some idols. You had some idols when you were in the world. 
Things that prevent, that stood between you and God. I'm not talking about a Mary statue. I'm talking about things that stood and don't, yeah, get rid of the Mary statue. That ain't even the right Mary. Come on, somebody, help me out here. That's not the right Mary. Oh, preacher, you're so mean. Mary would be turning over in her grave. Oh, Lord, help us. She's up there with the Lord. You know what Mary said? My soul doth magnify the Lord my God, my Savior. She called Jesus her Savior. Why would she do such a thing? The Catholic Church teaches that she was conceived of a, of a virgin. The Catholic, you didn't even know that, huh? That's what they call the Immaculate Conception, not Jesus. Mary. No, that's a lie. That, that, listen, I was born and raised Catholic. I'll talk about it if I want to. And I'll talk about AA meetings too if I want to, but I ain't going there right now. All right? Listen, I was born and raised Catholic. No, they're talking about the Immaculate Conception. They're trying to talk about Mary was born without sin. That is a lie. Mary was born just like you and I. And the Father, hallelujah, gave birth to himself in Christ. The Father gave birth to the eternal Son, and God became man. And the lineage has passed through the man. And he comes from altogether different seed. He comes to us without sin, hallelujah. But Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord my God, my Savior. That, I'm not even talking about that item, but get rid of it. Don't pray through Mary. Amen. Got people driving around with bumper stickers. If you can't get a hold of Jesus, try his mama. He listens to her. That's not who he listened to the day he turned water into wine, church. He listened to the Father. Come on, somebody. Yeah, Mary said it, but she said it well, lined up with the Father's will. It was the Father's will that Jesus turned water into wine. Not so that you could be a sipping saint. No. But to show the conversion of the internal miracle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That when you would hear the gospel, hallelujah, and put your faith in it. That that old clay pot that you were made of as you came out of Adam that was created from the earth. The earthen vessels that that water was in. That when Jesus turned that water into wine, hallelujah, it did a conversion miracle on the inside. You think that, you think that the first miracle God the Father is going to... You know why I'm preaching all, all this so hard? Because that's the kind of Christian I used to be. Mm. Whenever I was sipping my wine in the dark room when nobody was looking, I'm like, hmm, Jesus turned water into wine. I'm going to justify my actions. But the reality of it is that ain't why God the Father allowed Jesus to turn water into wine. Do you think for one second when the Bible specifically, explicitly says that drunkenness is a sin, that Jesus is going to wait to the end of the wedding when everybody's already inebriated and turn water into wine to get people more drunk? Do you honestly think for one second that, that, that Jesus would promote drunkenness? Come on, somebody. Is that, are we talking about the same Jesus? Are we talking about the sinless one that produces life and delivers people out of sin? Or are we talking about a different Jesus? That's all I want to know. Amen. Get rid of that Mary statue, but that ain't what I'm preaching on. I'm talking about them old idols that used to be in your life. I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you and cleanse you from your filthiness and all your idols. I will cleanse you. A new heart will I give you. Hallelujah. God wants to give you a new heart. A new spirit will I put within you. I will take away your stony heart. Lord, help us. Amen. Help every last one of us in this room. Help my children. Help your children. Help the people that we love not to have a stony heart. God said, I'll take a heart of stone out. I'll put a heart of flesh. Amen. A heart of flesh is one that's pliable and it's soft. Lord, help that's pliable and soft. Not that we would be hard like a rock, stubborn and rebellious, yeah. and refuse to listen to the word of God. Lord, help us. Yeah. Rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. Whenever we rebel against God and rebel against his word, we bring detriment upon our own soul. We bring detriment upon our own self. Lord, help us. Yeah. He says, I will take away your stony heart and put, give you a heart of flesh. And I said, look at this. This is the part I want you to see. I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk according to my statutes and my judgment. I have preached 
so long since the last passage, you know, I forgot what it was. In the first one, he said, there's a new covenant coming where I'm going to put my law in your heart. In this passage, he said, there's a new covenant coming where I'm going to put my spirit on the inside of you. And I'm talking about the altar and the cross where the water flowed from in the temple. And I want you to know in Colossians 2 and 14, he says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that's the law. See, on the outside, the law was against you and I because you can't live I don't care what that old school preacher was trying to say. He was trying to say some good stuff, better stuff than the garbage that the modern day preacher saying. Because he was saying you need to clean your life up, sinner. Cleanse your life, sinner. He was trying to tell us to live our lives in a different way that lined up with the word of God. But he wasn't telling us how to access the grace that we needed in order to do it. He was making it more like it was a rule book. More like it was an AA meeting. No, I ain't no alcoholic. I ain't no drug addict. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Oh, it's all good till you start quoting that stuff in the AA meeting. <laughs> it's all good. Oh, you can, your higher power can be whatever you want it to be. It can be this wooden table right here. Yeah, but you start quoting Jesus as your higher power too much, and boy, they'll start looking cross-eyed at you. <laughs> Uh-huh, yeah, they real, yeah, I know, don't tell me, I know, I done been there. Anyway, hallelujah, the handwriting, the law that was against us, because the law was against you and I, because even if you never, even if you never cheated, never lied, never stole, never slept with your neighbor's wife, never disobeyed your parents, never did all these things, you wanted to sleep with your neighbor's wife before, you wanted your neighbor's material possessions before. Don't say you, you wanted to sleep with your neighbor's husband for before. I'm just saying maybe not your next door neighbor. My point is is that you've lusted in your heart before is what I'm trying to say. Don't act like you ain't never lusted in your heart before church. Or am I in the right place or do I need to go to the to the church of the still living in having problems church somewhere down the road. Because I feel like I feel like maybe I'm preaching to the wrong crowd. No, we've all lusted in our heart because we're all together unworthy. Jeremiah said the heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? People don't like to hear that. Oh, preacher, don't say my heart is deceitfully wicked. I didn't say that. I just repeated what God said. That's the confusion here. I don't want no preacher that's going to yell and tell me that I'm a sinner. Okay, I'm yelling, but I'm not yelling at you. I'm just passionate, and I'm just repeating the word of God. That's the problem. And I'm admitting to you that I'm the, in the same boat with you because we're all born of Adam. Yeah. Amen. And we've all been born with a deceitful, wicked heart. And the quicker we can recognize that and say, Lord, open up the door, hallelujah, that you give us access through. Lord, thank you for going to the altar and dying on the cross for our sin. Lord, thank you that because you did that, the river is flowing, hallelujah. It is bringing life thank you, Lord. where there was previously. Mm -hmm. Colossians 2.14. Blotting out the law that was against us and contrary to us, he took it out of the way. What did he do with it? He nailed it to his cross. The whole point that I'm trying to make is what the song was singing earlier. He made all things new through his cross. The word of God can now live in your heart. The spirit of God can now live in your heart all because of the cross. You can have victory now because of the cross. The whole river of the Holy Ghost can flow into your life because of the cross. Don't tell me that my doctrine is wrong because it's the doctrine of the living God. You might be able to find things in my life that still don't line up with that, but don't tell me that the truth of the gospel doesn't say that Jesus Christ and Him crucified was the plan before the foundation of the earth because that's Go ahead and put it up there. First Peter 1.18. Go ahead and put it up there. Because that is the word of the living God. Hallelujah. First Peter 1.18. It teaches us that the plan of God was in existence before man ever fell. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed. What does that mean? To be purchased back. Uh, to be purchased. You were a slave, but you were purchased back. Redeemed and not with corruptible things such as silver or gold from your empty lifestyle is really what that's saying that you received from your fathers. Next verse. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish or without spot. Next verse. Who was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. 
Dude, that's it right there. The word of God tells us that before the world was ever completely manifest, before Adam was formed with the hand of God out of clay and placed in the garden, before any of that happened, God already knew the fall was going to take place. God already knew that we were going to be part of Adam's fallen race. And God foreordained a lamb that was without blemish, without spot, without dirt, without sin. And that his blood would be shed. The shedding of blood describes the killing of that animal, describes the death of Jesus. And that it would pay the slavery penalty and give us life. Instead of death, don't tell me that the doctrine doesn't say that it's all about what Jesus did for us at the cross because his cross makes all things new. Yeah. Yeah. The game changer is that the river of the Holy Spirit can flow into your life. I remember a long time ago, I was a person that was a preacher and some other people that taught the Bible and that's what they were saying about the doctrine then. It's not just the cross. It's the Holy Spirit too. Come on, man. Yeah. You think that we don't know that? No, that's what we're trying to say. The river can flow because of the cross. Because the door that it flowed under, because the altar that it came from, hallelujah, that Jesus died and it releases the dam that was held back and it allows that river to flow. <laughs> three, three passages of scripture that when viewed together show the transition. You're going to have to. These were three passages of scripture that show that the presence of God moved from the temple to the inside of our heart. That's what those that's what I was trying to show you with those scriptures. But going back to our passage and I'm going to move fast. The river of God brings life in verse seven of the passage we read originally. The river produced trees, right? On each side of the river bank. The trees produce the fruit for life. In verse 8, the river flows into deserts and death because it flowed into the Dead Sea. And it, re and it replaced death with life. It produced trees of life where it flows into the desert and the sea. It heals the sea. It heals the Dead Sea. The river restores and sustains life. The river is filled with fish. It's filled with life. Listen, I'm going to move fast, but John 15, he told us that he was the vine, we're the branch, and if we would abide or live in him, that we would bear fruit, just like trees on the side of the bank, bearing fruit. In Matthew 4, 19, he said to Peter and Andrew, his brother, he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I'm just seeing in this river all these fish, and it just reminds me of the souls of men, because I'm telling you this river is not only the Holy Spirit, but it's the gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ and it's flowing out and it's bringing life. Jesus promised believers in him that they would have rivers of living water flowing out of them. That's John chapter 7 verses 38 through 39. He said, he that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given yet because Jesus had not yet been glorified. This river flows today into people's lives and changes death to life. It recovers the hurting and heals their heart. It saves souls. There's going to be a day. If you, I'm not going to go to it, but in Revelation 22, 1 and 2, it describes this river. There's going to be a day where pain, heartache, disease, and death will be touched by the waters of this river. And, and that heartache is going to be no more. But until that day, the question that I have for you is, which path will you follow? Which path will I follow? Because Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says this, enter at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many will go that way. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life. But there will actually be few that find it. All right. I got five minutes to preach two points. You ready? Point number one. Will you follow him into the water? Yeah. That's what I want to know with, from you this morning. Will you follow him into the water? The prophecy described a man with a line in his hand. 
Now this, this line was some type of a measuring tool. Today we would say with the man with the tape measure in his hand. And he measured a, a, a certain amount of cubits, but each time he kept measuring how far the river went, the river got deeper. First it started off at the ankles, then it went to the knees, then it went to the waist, to the point where he was finally swimming in life. Can you imagine that? Swimming in living waters that flow from the finished work of Jesus. I want to ask you, wouldn't that be a beautiful thing to be swimming in living waters? I mean, you, you, you like to swim? I love to swim. I'm swimming some dirty water. I'm about to get into that in a second. But you swim, you're being saturated in it. You're immersed in it. Can you imagine being immersed in, the, in, the, in Christ? Living your life in this place where the living waters are bringing healing to you. Will you follow him into these waters? Yes. Amen. If you will, how deep will you go into these waters? You're going to just tip your toe a little bit? I want to find me a church that's just going to let me tip toe. Or will you put your ankle in there? Or are you willing to go up to the knees or the waist? Or are you ready to swim into the things of God? And listen to me. What does that even mean? Because if you listen to some preachers, they're going to tell you, oh, swimming in the will of God is for you to do a Jericho march around the church. Or swimming in the, in the will of God is going to be you crying tears at the altar. And listen to me, I, I long for a church where we all come to the altar and worship, if it's real. I, I, I'm, I'm cool with you breaking out and doing a Jericho march if it's what's exploding in your heart. Amen. Amen. Not because you, you think the preacher wants you to do that. No, because you're overwhelmed with the joy of God and you can care less. Hallelujah. What the person on the side of you thinks. Because you got a personal testimony, my friend. Amen. Of where you, you were in prison and you were in darkness, but the Lord showed up and he spoke to you and he changed your life. Amen. So how deep will you go? Just to the ankles, the knees, the waist, or will you swim in the presence of God? I got to tell you, that there's riches found in the depths of these waters. I'm about to get into it. But I was thinking this morning about a swimming pool. And I was thinking about, depending on where you're swimming, what kind of river you're swimming in, right? You could be swimming in dirty water. Well, let's just use swimming pools. You could be swimming in a clean pool. You could be swimming in a dirty pool. The world, if you're swimming in the world, my friend, you're swimming in a dirty pool. Right. What are you trying to talk about? I ain't going to spell it out for you. If you are allowing the world, all of its mindsets, all of its cultures, its music to influence you, listen to me, I'm not trying to talk about you gotta walk up in Walmart and be like, ah, oh my gosh, it's Cardi B, or it's like, you know, whoever that, yeah, Cardi, Cardi B, and she's singing about her privacy or something. Ah, I can't know, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, man, yeah, come on, Cardi B. Fill me up with this world. Fill me up with, that's what I'm talking about. Christians out there that are still allowing themselves to be filled up with the world. And they got a preacher that's going to sit there and powder their butt the whole time and act like it's just fine. Oh, man, I need to put a little dexitin on this one. Rash is getting kind of deep. And then we'll put a little bit of powder on top of it. No, that is not the will of God. Amen. I don't have enough time. I got to just say it like it needs to be said because I ain't got enough time. We're running out of time. Not in the service. In the end of this world, we're running out of time. Lord, help us. So what pool are you swimming in? You swimming in the pool of the world? Listen, this morning I remember something. It's gross, but I'm going to say it. It, it. Because it's an illustration. I don't know. If, so like, I like to exercise. And for a while there, I was trying to train. I thought I was going to run an Ironman one day. That ain't happening. But I went to the YMCA, and I was swimming up in that pool. And I swam as much as three miles before in that pool. I'm swimming, and all of a sudden, I'm like, dude, what is all that brown stuff in the bottom of this pool? <laughs> yeah, and it was only one of two things, my friend. <laughs> it was either somebody else's dirt or somebody else's poop. <laughs> and every now and then, they clean it, and I forget it was there, and I do my swimming. But then there, sure enough, another week or so goes by, and there it is again, all that brown sediment at the bottom of that pool. And I was like, man, this is really gross. 
and one day I need to quit swimming in this pool. Amen. But tomorrow I'll be swimming again. And finally, man, I'm going to set myself free, brothers and sisters. I don't swim in that pool no more. Amen. Amen. But I'm here to tell you that that's what it's like. So just because you don't see the dirt, just because you don't see the poop, what kind of poopy pools are we swimming in is the point that I'm trying to make. Because when we're swimming in the poopy pools of the world, <laughs> And we're getting that diaper rash on our butt. Do you think that you find that your preacher that's going to powder your backside and going to make it better? It ain't going to make it better. Pow talcum powder ain't going to fix the problems of the world. It's going to require a flowing river that brings life and is available to you because of what Jesus did at the cross. Hallelujah. And the fact that he shed his blood. Listen to me. This gospel is a, is a bloody gospel. This gospel word right here will remind you and I of our sin. And it makes people feel uncomfortable. And they want to get away from it. But you should not want to get away from this, Christian. You should want to run to it. Run to the rivers of living water because they will bring life. They will turn salt into fresh. Hallelujah. They will bring life where it used to be death. Hallelujah. I'm talking about a fresh life. There's depths of riches in this water. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. The depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Think about that. The wisdom and knowledge of God. Where do you get your wisdom and knowledge from, Christian? Just saying, there's a whole lot of sources. It's kind of like where you get your news from, yeah. right? I mean, if you watch certain news organizations, they're going to convince you. I, listen to me, I can't prove nothing to you. But I'm going to tell you this one thing, and if you don't like it, then you can find you another church. If they stole that election, if they stole that election, we should be screaming and, and throwing dust in the air and saying, oh my gosh, because you know what? If they stole that election and they get away with it, I just don't know. Well, why would you think they stole the election? I don't know why. Why do you got people on videos, supposedly, where the woman is training people how to change the ballots in the voting machine? Why? They got video and I think it was in Atlanta, of people pulling suitcases out and unloading ballots. Why in New York State, in that Senate race, the woman, or one of them, is winning by thousands of votes, then now all of a sudden, they're, now this was on Fox News, and you can't even believe Fox News no more, but if Fox News said it, surely it's true. Why she was, they were winning by thousands of votes, then now all of a sudden they were only winning by 12 votes talking about the Republican candidate. And I'm not even here to talk about Republicans because half the time they lying. I'm just talking about I want to vote for somebody that's going to do what they say and stand up for what's right. And I believe in life. And if I want to own a gun, I'm going to be able to own a gun because the Constitution said that I can. And if I want to talk, then I ought to be able to talk without having to worry about Facebook uh, blocking me and getting rid of me. Come on, somebody. I don't even like Facebook. I'm just trying to make a point. <laughs> If I want to talk, I'm about to say what I'm allowed to say. Because you're allowed to say what you want to say. That's right. All of a sudden, she, the person's winning by 12 points and they open up a drawer somewhere. I'm talking about, dude, how, this just happened three days ago, I think. How long has the election been over? I don't know. It, we're not talking about the presidential election, but it doesn't matter. It was still on that election night. And they found 12 votes in a drawer somewhere. Really, dude? And they're going to count it? And so now it... When does it stop? Yeah. That's the point. That I'm trying to make. If I don't even know why I got off on that, <laughs> but I'm just saying this world is corrupt, yeah. and there's and, and and this world is changing before our very eyes. And if you live in fear to that, well, we don't want to do the right thing because then now there's going to be chaos in the street, buddy. Let me tell you something. At the rate we're going, there's going to be chaos in the street anyway, my friend. Yeah. You better batten down the hatches and you better get ready. And, you, and if you think your bullets and your gun are going to fix the situation, you ain't got enough bullets and guns to fix that situation. You better know how to hold on to Jesus. And you better go to the end. Hallelujah. Holding on to him. The wisdom and knowledge of God. 
You know, <laughs> until you crack that book open, you'll never learn about the things of God. The only knowledge you'd be operating off of, that's why I went off on that, that diatribe, was because of the news. You'd just be listening to everything that the world tells you, and you'll be believing it before long, because you won't have an alternating voice to give you a different opinion. That's why I'm trying to say we got the time short. I ain't got time to monkey around. I got to tell the truth. If you ain't ever got a hold of this and you ain't ever taken the time to open it up to see what the knowledge of God looks like, because you see, before you can gain, before you can learn the wisdom of God, you got to have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Once you get the knowledge of God on the inside of you and you begin to apply it in your daily life, it becomes wisdom. Don't ever, don't ever become so despondent when you fail God that you're ready to quit. Because listen to me, God takes the mistakes. The word of God says that a righteous man falls seven times, but he get, gets back up. Am I preaching that it's okay to sin? Absolutely not. That would be an atrocity and I would be no longer worthy to be, a, to be a preacher of the gospel. But what I am trying to say is this. God ain't done with you. God ain't given up on you. God sent his son Jesus to die for you. You think he's going to give up on you because you failed him? No. He wants you to get back up. He wants you to put more knowledge in your life so that the next time you come across that bin, you can make a different decision based on the word of God instead of the things that you learn from the world. He wants you to quit swimming in the poopy pool. <laughs> if you swim in the river of life, you will gain access into the depths of his knowledge and wisdom. The mind of God, the knowledge of God will begin to influence the decisions that you make, the way you think, the places you go, the company you keep. If you keep hanging out with the people of the world that are sinners, Amen. you sooner or later are going to start sinning. Amen. If they drink, sooner or later you're going to be getting drunk. Because ain't nobody around here sipping wine just to, because they love the way it tastes. Man, I'm so done with that. Come on, man. They, sit, they, drinking, they drinking it so that they can get a buzz. You ain't allowed to Drive buzzed, are you? So how can you live for Jesus buzzed? Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> I got more scripture for that, but we ain't got time. I'm not preaching on drinking. But if you hang around with people that drink, you're going to start drinking. If you hang around people that smoke dope, you're going to start smoking dope. If you hang around people long enough that cuss, you're probably going to start cussing. Unless you can change the atmosphere. You know? And then still, do you, are you going to go purposely hang out? Look, I got a dude make my cabinets one time. That dude had the filthiest mouth. I'm talking about he said words that I ain't heard said. My daddy didn't even say some of these words. And my daddy used some words, bro. He was a Marine. Oh, he probably used them. I just never heard him say it. <laughs> I was just like, oh, it's cringing. I, I let him make my cabinets. I'm like, dude, y'all. And then finally, they were just, when they found out I was a Christian, they started ha ha making jokes. And I'm like, dude, you can make all the jokes you want to, brother. But the crazy thing is that you don't understand. I wasn't always this way. I done ran with folk like you. I don't want to be like you. I don't want to be with you. I'll let you make my cabinets. I didn't say that. But I'll let you make my cabinets. But you think I'm going to come? No, not if you acting like that. Not if you talking like that. Not if you looking, oh, come on, preacher. You know you want a little cookie or crack. Go get you a prostitute every night. No, no, no. I don't want to take no cookie or crack. I don't want no little nibble of the cheese. That's because why? Because I done tried to nibble cheese and like a rat with my head in a trap, I couldn't get out. Yeah, the Lord done convinced me. And you know what? Lo and behold, after my cabinets were in there, I used to go to Ashland Jail. And then little crowds of people would come up there and I'd preach to them through the little tray hole. And I was over there preaching, boy, and I was talking about, look, the world will destroy you. The world. And Look at you, sir. I said, dude, you make, let me tell you something. You are a good cabinet maker, bro. I love them cabinets you made for me. And I meant it. But and that's all I'm going to say. Because I ain't got nothing negative to say. Because I done told you while I was up in your office. Amen. Where the rubber meets the road. I don't want to be part of that. If you hang around with that long enough, you're going to be, that's an extreme story, yes. But it wouldn't. So just because you get a little bit at a time and, well, I only say one little cuss word every now and then. No, it ain't right, dude, for us to talk that way. Right. Amen. If you talk a certain way, I'm just preaching, I'm taking my liberty this morning. Y'all ain't got, y'all the ones that showed up, I'm going to preach. <laughs> If you say a word or speak in such a way that when you walk away, like Robert used to say, can you go back and tell them about your Jesus? And you can't. Mm -hmm. You didn't do what was right in that situation. And we should have the knowledge of that. 
Let your speech be seasoned with salt. Don't be, and don't be speaking things that are unseemly. Don't live your life in an unseemly manner. Don't be a brute. <laughs> Hallelujah. And when, and, but you know what you do? A righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. The knowledge of God told me there's a certain way I'm to conduct my lifestyle. I messed up on that one. But now I'm going to let that knowledge of God, and, the, and, and sooner or later it's going to turn into wisdom. Because I'm not going to swim in that poopy pool. I'm going to start swimming in the pool that's filled with the rivers of life. I'm going to allow the word of God to infiltrate on the inside of me and to begin to change my mind, begin to change my heart, begin to change my life to where when I face that situation again, I got another opportunity. Amen? Amen. Got another opportunity to do it different. That was point number one. Will you follow him into the water? Point number two. I'm going to finish. it. The deeper you go, the stronger you grow. The Ezekiel passage spoke of trees of life growing on the banks of the river. The water nourished the trees and the trees produced fruit. The fruit of the trees brought healing and sustained life. The word of God takes sinners and plants them as trees near the water where they can be nourished. These trees, once planted and nourished, grow and produce fruit. And the fruit that these trees produce brings life to other people. What kind of fruit do you want to produce? Do you want to produce fruit in your life that brings life to other people? Amen. God, if we just give God just a little bit, we'd be amazed at what he can do with us. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and he said, you know what? I was in the presence of this person that I care about. And I told him, look, I ain't doing this no more. I'm telling you right now. Somebody else showed up and they started doing the very thing that he said that he wasn't going to do. Got up and walked out. And I, whenever he told me that story, I'm like, dude, let me tell you something. You were the topic of conversation after you left that situation. They were talking. You, whoever that person was, was telling that other person that you said that you wasn't going to partake of that anymore. And when you got up and walked out, he told that other person the story. I'm telling you right now, he told that other person the story and they probably laughed about you. But guess what? The Holy Spirit will... Let's pray right now. Let's pray for them two people right now that the Holy Spirit is going to use that story and that little moment of their jesting and their laughter to bring conviction in their heart and to show them in their own life that they're not where God would want them to be. Mm. Listen to me. God will show up and do things that you didn't even know He did. You, you won't even know all the things that God will do in your life till you get to glory and you can see it. In Isaiah 61, verse 3, it says to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for, the mor for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. This passage of scripture is where Jesus, you remember when Jesus went to the synagogue and they handed him the the scroll of Isaiah, and he read, that's what he read. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news. And he said, this very word is being fulfilled in your eyes today. And it was preached so that the brokenhearted could be healed, so that those that were captive could be released from their prison, so that those in sorrow could trade in their mourning for joy, trade in a spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise, so that they would be like trees of righteousness, so that God would be glorified. Just like those trees of life that produced life, the fruit of life, on the banks of that river where the Holy Spirit was flowing, God wants to take you and I and plant us as trees of righteousness so that we would bear fruit in our lives so that other people would have the opportunity to know that there's another way. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. Blessed is the man. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Is he your hope this morning? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Help me out here. I feel like I got to go get me a go to, for preaching to meddling. <laughs> is he our hope? Yes. Or is the depression medicine our hope? Is he our hope? Oh, the preacher wants everybody to get off the depression. Nah, the preacher ain't told you to get off your depression medicine. Then you're going to blame me whenever bad stuff starts happening. No, no. But if you're trusting in your depression medicine and not trusting in Jesus, I might be the only guy in town saying it, but I'm going to tell you right now, that ain't God's will for your life. Amen. Are you trusting in the Lord? 
Or are you trusting, we used to, I don't know, we, that's why we used to call them doobies back in the day. Are you trusting in smoking salt? Are you trusting in the Lord or are you trusting in, man, well, I had a rough day, dude. I just want a glass of wine. Take the edge off. What are we trusting in? See, that's, I, I got to spell it out for you so that you know what I'm talking about. How are we learning as Christians to truly trust in Jesus in the midst of dark times, in the midst of bad times? Because if we have to live through some dark and bad times, you might not be able to go to the store to get a bottle of wine. You might not be able to go down the street to your plug and get whatever it is you're trying to get. You might not be able to go to your doctor and get the medication that you're looking for. I'm not telling you to stop taking your medicine. What I'm trying to say is this. Look to Jesus, the author and the finish of your faith, the door that leads you into access to the presence of God, where the rivers of living water flow, and where there's dead stuff, he brings it to life. He shall be as a tree, Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8, whose hope is the Lord, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreads out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat comes. For, but her leaf shall be green. See, even in the heat of the day, your leaf will still be green. And shall not be careful or anxious. It's not God's will that you live in anxiety. Sorry, my friend. Not, oh, I got people close to me. I got family members that, 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 just, uh, that have been stricken. by. But it is not God's will that you and I, that's what that word is. It says careful, but in the Hebrew and also in the Greek where it uses it. It's talking about anxiety. It is not God's will for us to live in a mode of panic. It is God's will that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding would fill your heart and your mind. That is God's will. And not going to see when the heat comes, your leaves going to stay green. Not going to be anxious in the year of drought. Neither shall you cease from yielding your fruit. Because why? Your hope is in the Lord. I said your hope is in the Lord. Put your eyes on Jesus. Put your mind on Jesus. Don't but listen to me. You better be careful. I'm not over here picking on nobody, but I'm telling you right now. You better be careful of the music you listen to. You better be careful of the preachers that you listen to. Because if they're telling you a different story about a different Jesus or a different way of life, or you think that the music today is not telling people to look to other things to solace their pain, yes. to quiet the noise in their life? No, that's exactly what it's doing. Oh, I don't like that preacher. He's picking on all my stuff. Well, guess what? The Lord picks on me, so you get picked on too. <laughs> I'm closing with this. Promise. I've been on this earth long enough to know that it's filled with heartache and pain. I know it. I've experienced it. And suffering. But I also know this. That the anointing of the Lord produces trees of righteousness. Produces the plantings of the Lord. And he plants his trees by the river of life. So that their roots can be nourished. So that those trees can weather storms and droughts. And continue producing fruit for God. Brendan shared this scripture with me the other day. John 15 and 5. Jesus said, I am the vine. You're the branch. He that abides in me. What does that mean? Live somewhere. Stay somewhere. Amen. Connected to the vine. Hallelujah. And I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You're not going to be able to live in this world without Jesus. Right. You're not going to be able to turn your back on the things that used to be your idols without Jesus. You're not going to be able to turn your hope without the help of the Holy Spirit from the things that you've been putting your hope in to truly learning how to trust Jesus. And listen to me, friend. It doesn't happen overnight. It does not happen overnight. But let us all, starting with the preacher, take a step in the right direction. And let us all start walking in the right direction by the grace of God.